Welcome. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Turner. I am uh, with the Sacramento History Museum and welcome to an online presence of the museum. I am uh, the ed in the education department of the museum. I'm in the messy office division of the education department and uh, it's my privilege to present you tonight with, with something new, something we are calling Talking History, which we expect to make a, a, a series, but uh, we have our first distinguished speaker, Clarence Caesar, who will talk about to be black in 19th century Sacramento, and I will introduce him in just a bit. I will say at the start, I hope you are well and safe. We share your wish that the museum opens, reopens soon and the tours and programs can resume. Uh, but this program is the happy result of the pandemic, if there can be such a thing as a happy result from it. But uh, because we, we are closed, the museum is closed, but inside we have been very busy. And with your interest and support and the support of our of the Sacramento History Alliance Board of Directors, uh, our Museum Director Delta Pick Mello, our city historian Marsha Iman, and the hardworking staff, we have learned and built an online presence and we continue <clears throat> to learn and continue to build. And it started about 11 months ago with impromptu programs, hands-on history lessons for students and has grown into our formal education programs, uh, including virtual tours that we've been able to reach a, a far, a wider, farther away audience, students who could not come here to Sacramento. We bring Sacramento history <laughs> to them. We have been able to present our online history camp, uh, after school history programs, workshops uh, in book binding and typography that tie into our new California in print exhibit, which we are anxious for you to come finally into the museum and see. We have even managed to stage an original melodrama online, holiday presentations. Our living history uh, group has done its ghost tour online. Uh, we've been able to do our underground, underground after hours and gold fever games <laughs> online. And in addition to that, we have expanded our social media presence, providing a daily flow of historical information. And one thing that occurred in the pandemic, which we could not have accounted for is that the Sacramento History Museum is the number one museum in the world for its use of the app TikTok. And that's thanks in large part to our volunteer printer, Howard Hatch, uh, one of our staffers, Jared Jones, trained a camera on him and did a miniature printing terms lesson. And the first one that Howard and Jared did has now rocketed well past 5 million views. So uh, we, <laughs> our museum leads the world in uh, TikTok. And we have one minute history lessons on there as well. So we, uh, we have been able to make the most of the pandemic. Uh, we will continue to do our online and social media presence uh, even after the museum and the tours finally open. Speaking of new, here's something that's new. Uh, and I am going to explain it to you first because I wish it was explained to me the first time I heard it. It was kind, kind of unusual, but it's called a land acknowledgement. And if you haven't heard it, you will soon hear it whenever you participate in a museum or a public institution of its kind program. It's a state formal statement in which we acknowledge the whose land this had, this was, and we celebrate and <laughs> or to the uh, native cultures living and thriving today and do what we can to support their presence in, in the way that the museum can. So our, uh, our land acknowledgement statement goes as follows. The Sacramento History Museum recognizes that it sits on the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Nisanan and Miwok native people. The Sacramento region was a gathering place for many native groups, including the Southern Maidu and the Valley and Plains Miwok, and we extend our respect and gratitude to these peoples. This museum has a responsibility to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of these lands and their culture as well as the hist and the culture as well as the histories of their dispossession. We recognize the role our exhibits, programs, and relationships have in shaping these histories. And during the course of the talk, I will put on a chat a link if you want to know inf more information. So one more thing before we uh, 
go to our, the reason for your being here is just uh, nuts and bolts about the program. It, it is a conversation, it's a webinar, so the conversations take the form of, of typing in chat. And if you could please uh, type your questions in chat as opposed to Q&A, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, I hope. Uh, I won't be able to read them if they're in the Q&A, unfortunately, but the chat box will open up in the center of the screen and you can drag and move that away so you can see the presentation uh, tonight. Uh, and um, let's see, and our, our, our images too, you can move around on the screen or you should too. So there, uh, it's an honor to introduce Clarence Caesar, uh, and I'm already asking him back because his vast knowledge in the subject matter tonight uh, extends far beyond the 19th century. So uh, I'd love to have him back and talk about uh, the 20th and 21st century. Clarence is a retired historian with the California Department of Parks and Recreation, where he worked for 14 years in the Office of Historic Preservation, and he traveled the state extensively, including uh, my hometown on the Central Coast, Lompoc. He was also a grants administrator in the Office of Grants and Local Services. He earned his bachelor's degree in history at University of California, Davis, and his master's at California State University, Sac Sacramento, or what we call Sac State. Uh, th his thesis of source of which is uh, a big part of this presentation was an historical overview of the development of Sacramento's Black community from 1850 to 1983. And it is also the source of two uh, documentaries produced by KVIE, our Sacramento PBS station, which are remain a catalog. You can see them on KVIE. Uh, the, his, Mr. Caesar's career has allowed him to be a community college instructor or a researcher, a consultant, guest curator in five exhibits about African Americans in Sacramento and the Central Valley. He also served on the Sac City, Sacramento City and County Museum His History Commission, and we directly benefit because he also serves on the Sacramento History Alliance Board of Directors. He is born and raised in this area and now lives in Sacramento with his wife, Denise. And our city historian, Marsha Iman, says of Clarence, no one in the Sacramento area knows more about this history than Clarence. So can't say it plainer than that. And so I'm proud to introduce to you, Mr. Clarence Caesar. Thank you very much, Sean, for that wonderful introduction. And, and I just wanted to kind of expand on the, a little, just a little bit on the, uh, the native tribes that we can be honoring today in terms of the entire Sacramento metropolitan area, the Potwin of in Yolo County, and also the, Yosh, the Washoe of uh, going toward the Tahoe area were also part of, you know, part of our experience in terms of the Sacramento region as we know it today, the seven county Sacramento region, which uh, includes Sacramento, Yolo, El Dorado, Placer, Nevada, uh, and uh, Sutter in Yuba. So we have, a, you know, there's a, a wide range of, of groups that have uh, come in and I'm lo I love the, the, the effort and the, uh, the effort of, of acknowledging those groups because they did play a major role in preserving this land that we all live, where we all live today. So thank you again. Uh, I just wanted to say that this particular presentation will be an overview because, you know, in terms of African American history, there's a lot that you can talk about. And so what I want to do is just make sure that uh, the viewer gets an overview of the 19th century experience of African Americans and that uh, they leave here with a better knowledge and understanding of what that experience was and uh, why it's relevant today in terms of how Sacramento is, how it developed, how it became the Sacramento that we know today and, and how we can probably move forward uh, with ideas and how to make it a better place to live despite all the advances that have been made since that time. So uh, I'd like to, uh, we can get started with the PowerPoint presentation. Sure. And um, because that'll be the kind of the basis of, of what we're going to be talking, with, talking about today. So this will be primarily um, dealing with some of the, again, some of the major, major issues uh, that uh, African-Americans faced and, and also some of the people that were very influential in making this region the way it is today. Okay, everybody can see that. I'm Okay, all right. Okay, you can hit the first one if you want. Sure. 
I wanted to start the discussion out just uh, basically talking about how many African Americans were here in the 19th century. And so I produced this particular table here that produces by decade the numbers of African Americans in the city of Sacramento, the county of Sacramento, the total city population, the total county population, and the percentage of African Americans that were there as part of those populations. <clears throat> So you can see going from 1850 to, 19, to 1900, the population reached a peak of 456 individuals in the city of Sacramento, 513 people in the county of Sacramento. And you can look at the next two uh, uh, boxes over and you can see uh, the populations of the city and county in, in those areas as well. And you can see that the African-American population never exceeded 1.8% at any time during that period, this uh, period during that decades. So uh, next slide. And now you can see basically the statewide population of African-Americans in California, the entire state. And uh, of course, 1850, 92,000. You know, they always say, you know, thousands and, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people rushed in, but what people don't understand by 1850, some of those people left the population was very transient at that time. So people would get frustrated. They would go to another state to look for other, you know, adventures and claims uh, that might've arisen in that short time period. So by the time the 1850 stats census, which is the very first census in California uh, under European and American rule uh, came about, uh, they only counted 92,597 total population of which 962 were free African-Americans. Now, we all know that in the gold rush, some people that came to California were from the South and they tended to bring with them slaves to work the fields and, and, and uh, the gold mines that were ari arising at that time. The reason we don't have an accurate count of the slave population, one, is because in 1849 during its constitutional convention in Monterey, California essentially outlawed slavery as a way of making itself palatable to the Congress of the United States as an entry into the state, into the United States as a state. So uh, in 1850, the 1850 census was very different from previous censuses with regard to slavery because previous censuses never put a name or a face to slaves. They were just counted as three-fifths of a person in accordance with the American constitution. And then nothing else was really said about them. By 1850, Congress had decided that it wanted to put a name at least to the slaves that were owned by the you know, slave owners in the South. And this was resisted in the South by congressmen from Southern states because they didn't really want any particular personage to be applied to these people by name or any other means. So the uh, census takers, when they did California, were mindful of this. So they basically went out of their way not to try to recognize slaves if they, even if they did find them. And this worked in the favor of the slave owners who came to California because one, they were dealing in clandestine activity. Think of slave uh, owners, much like you think of drug dealers coming into California from wherever they come from, northern, southern border. They don't want you to know they're there. Now, some slave owners were pretty bold, like Samuel, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson Green and, and others who openly uh, acknowledged that they were working slaves, but they were always met resistance from the free soil miners who came from the Northern states and from the East Coast. So for slave owners, having the slaves counted was a much, it was a risky proposition. So we'll re never really know how many slaves actually came into California. I've heard estimates three to 500, that might even be low. But the reality is, is that uh, we do know how many free blacks came to California in 1950. And that when they came to California, they had to deal with the issue of slavery. They had to deal with the issue of discrimination, which we'll get into later on. But as you can see, California's population between 1850 and 1900 for the entire state never exceeded 11,000 people. You have more black people than that in, in neighborhoods in big cities <laughs> all over California, even small cities like Antioch and, and Elk Grove. So 
just imagine for yourself, if you're an African-American in California and there's only 11,000 of you over the entire state, how much juice do you really have? Well, how much juice did you really have in terms of what you can affect, what you can uh, uh, influence in terms of economic or social uh, or political activity? So that's, those were the first odds that we're talking about that African-Americans faced uh, when they came to California during the gold rush, whether they came overland, whether they came around the horn, these were all three to six month tours <laughs> of torture and pain, but they saw in California the promise of a better life. And that's what, that's what drove them here in the small numbers that they came. Next slide. Next, oh, next slide. Oops, gotta kill that. Sorry about that. This one. Anyway, the discovery of gold in 1848 by James Marshall triggered a human migration to Northern California that was international in scope, in which a lot of people probably already know. Next slide. And by 1849, more than 100,000 men and women from around the world entered California via sea and land routes. And nearly 1,000 of those were uh, African-Americans, both slave and free, who found themselves among these early immigrants. So by, of course, as we noted in the previous slide, the state's first official slit census counted 962 free black men and women among its ranks and the actual number of enslaved of black men and women in California during any period after 1849 remains unknown to this day. Next slide, please. So free black men and women, again, as I mentioned earlier, saw the benefit, the economic benefit of striking it rich in the gold fields, but it didn't guarantee them total social and political equality. And by that, uh, they were basically facing the same situations that they knew back East, back in the Midwest, as free Black men. When you think about the numbers of free Black men in relation to the numbers of slaves that existed in California in 1850, it's a pretty minuscule amount. The 1840 census, for instance, that they counted only about right around less than a half a million free Black men in the United States at that time. They counted over 4 million plus slaves at that time. So free black people only made up about 10% of the total uh, African-American population that existed in the United States at any given time. And you, if you figure that they were spread throughout the uh, Southeast, throughout the Northeast, throughout the Midwest, again, they were, were talking about small numbers of people that were free and of color in those communities. So even though they were free, they were still oppressed in many ways that uh, were determined whether or not they could live where they wanted to, or whether they could testify in courts, whether they could vote, whether the kids could go to the same schools, white children, all these issues that African-Americans felt back in those communities back East were going to be felt by the African-American communities here in California as a result of their coming here in the 1850s. And the slave black men who arrived with their Southern masters or who came, um, <clears throat> For looking for their own freedom or freedom of loved ones and relatives back home, saw the gold rush as an opportunity to perhaps make enough money from mining gold or whatever other enterprise they wanted to be involved in to pay for their own freedom and for the freedom of their loved ones back home. Next slide, please. And no one reflects this, this ambition, this uh, um, reality more than Alvin Coffey. Alvin Coffey arrived in California in 1849 as the property of Dr. William Bassett of Missouri. He, working as a miner and launderer while he was in California, Mr. Coffey earned $616 in savings. And that's in, of course, $1850. He returned to Missouri with Mr. Bassett in 1851. So there was, a, there was an agreement that Alvin was going to come to the United States and then return to Missouri. Unfortunately for Alvin, uh, Dr. Bassett kept his $1,616 in savings and then sold him to his wife's master, Mr. Uh, Nelson Tendall. Now, arriving back in uh, Missouri, Alvin basically made an agreement with his new master, Mr. Tendall, that he would come back to California, work the mines, and then earn enough money to come back to Missouri and buy the freedom of his 
himself, his wife, his, two, his three children, and his mother-in-law. And Mr. Tyndall, knowing Alvin's work ethic and his perseverance, agreed to the deal. So Alvin came back to California in 1854, he worked in the Shasta mines, which are up north, and saved over $7,000 by 1857. Those savings enabled him to purchase his freedom, as well as the freedom of his wife, his three children, and his mother-in-law. With his family reunited, they came back to California, Overland, on the Overland Trail, and settled in Tehama County in the town of Red Bluff. So again, this is, we're talking a, a, a statewide incident here. His family and descendants became prominent citizens in Tehama and Shasta County. And Mr. Coffee himself was inducted and remains the only member, African-American member of the California Society of Pioneers, which is one of the highest honors that the pioneers give themselves and the families give themselves in California. And he remained an avid member in good standing until his death on October 28th, 1902. And Alvin Coffey is buried in Oak Hill Cemetery in Red Bluff with his wife and children. So again, this is the kind of representative of the ambitions that African-American slaves had when they came to California. There are numerous other stories like this. Uh, there's one story of the Ray family uh, in Cal in, uh, back in Texas, uh, who's a descendant of Clarissa Reeves Ray, uh, wrote a book called uh, uh, I forget the name Pat Sipsy right now, to mend, the broke, to mend the Broken Chain, where she recounts that Mr. Ray was separated from his mother, uh, who, became, who left California as a slave, who was brought to California, and that over the years, he tried to reunite with his mother, even after he was free, happened to run across a guy back in Texas who saw his mom in Sacramento, and he basically made arrangements to try to make his way to Sacramento to reunite with his parents, and he successfully did so. And then he made the rest of, he spent the rest of his life in Sacramento as a community member in Sacramento. So these types of stories are, are pretty common, uh, but they show the ambition of African-Americans who were enslaved to overcome the condition that brought them there. The next slide, please. So among the earliest African-American arrivals to the gold fields were the men and women, the men who established the mining claims at Negro Bar, Negro Hill, and Massachusetts Flats along the American River in 19, 1849 and 1850 in what is now Eastern Sacramento County and Western El Dorado County near what is now the city of Folsom. So th this uh, next slide will give you kind of the depiction, an artist's depiction of the mining activity at Negro Bar at that time. It was um, Negro Bar, the African-American presence there lasted from 1849 uh, to late 1850. So they were there roughly about a year before moving on to Negro Hill and some of these other mining sites in eastern in uh, Western El Dorado County. So this, this is a depiction uh, of that. And as you can see, of course, they're pan mining, which was the earliest form of gold mining that miners did in California after they arrived here in 1849. Next slide, please. And what is interesting about these particular mining sites, the three I just announced, was that they were once part of a 35,000 acre plus land grant known as Rancho Rilo de los Americanos, owned by William Alexander Liedersdorf, a prominent Afro-Caribbean rancher and businessman who resided in Yerba Buena, which is now San Francisco, until from 1841 until his untimely death in 1848. Next slide, please. Liedersdorf is really a real fascinating character for, for a number of different reasons. Uh, first off, he was born in San Croix, uh, the, the son of a Danish planter, because uh, San Croix was under Danish uh, colonial rule at that time in the 1810. His mother was a, uh, what would we call an octoroon, which is a woman, a woman who would be one eighth black, uh, the rest being a mix of probably white and, or Native American or whatever. So William Alexander Leidersdorf grew up in a basically a mixed household. His father was well-to-do and basically because of Danish law, he sought an education for his son and, and William Alexander Leidersdorf was educated under Dan the Danish school system that they had, uh, had at the, uh, on the island. He also took him to Denmark. His father also took him to Denmark when he was six years old 
to have him educated there as well. So he stayed in Denmark uh, for about maybe four or five or six years and then returned to San Croix as a teenager and uh, basically uh, learned the, the, uh, the, the way of life there. By the time he was uh, 21, he left San Croix uh, and arrived in Baltimore with uh, naturalization papers as they called them back then. <laughs> but uh, basically they were kind of forged papers, but it enabled him to enter the country. And he became a, uh, a, a, a sea captain, a ship's captain. And he uh, would sail in and out of Baltimore. And that's how he learned this, the sailing trade. And he made his way to New Orleans as a result. And he stayed there another four or five years, also as a, a ship's captain. And he shipped uh, as a captain, uh, he commanded about four or five different vessels. And the longest uh, trip that he took in this particular, particular guard, regard was to Hawaii. So he became very well acquainted with uh, sailing both the uh, Eastern coast and the Pacific Ocean. Liedersdorf left uh, New Orleans in 1841 and arrived in Yerba Buena Island, which is now San Francisco and uh, aboard this uh, ship called the Lydian and Julianne and uh, with the intention of really not staying, but uh, the, the gentleman who owned the Julianne, the boat that he was, that he arrived on, basically sold the boat to somebody else <laughs> and it kind of stranded Liedersdorf from San Francisco. So Liedersdorf being very enterprising, looked around and saw that he could make a life there. So basically he opened up the first commercial warehouse in San Francisco, or Rio Buena, and that commercial warehouse served the uh, sailing community that uh, went in and out of San Francisco. And that included Spanish and Mexican vessels, as well as some of the English and other uh, American vessels that frequented Yerba Buena Island at that time. Because now it was, you know, Yerba Buena Island was being discovered as a, a viable port and as a viable harbor to do commercial business. And then through the intercession of um, John Sutter, Niedersdorf was able to convince the Mexican governor to give him a land grant, a 35,525 acre land grant that we know is Rancho Rio de los Americanos, uh, Rancho of the American River, on which he intended to uh, basically raise cattle, uh, to sell hides, uh, grow farm vegetables that he could you know, sell to locals in the uh, New Helvetia area around Sutter's Fort and uh, other activities. Next slide, please. So Liedersdorf became very prominent uh, in, in Yerba Buena and he became real good friends with a very important person by the name of Thomas O. Larkin. And Thomas O. Larkin was the vice, was the council general under a president of Polk, the United States president, who basically was scouting out California with the intention of one day maybe overtaking it, taking it over. So Liedersdorf uh, became a, a, was named under Thomas o. Larkin, vice counsel. And as vice counsel, Liedersdorf was able to become even more engaged in the trade and other activities that were going on in at that time. Once uh, the Americans came in enough sufficient numbers, uh, they basically decided that uh, California was ripe for the taking. So in 1846, they, uh, had what they called the Bear Flag Revolt, and they basically, at Sonoma, and they basically raised the Bear Flag, which was the first indication that Americans intended to take, militarily take over California. And Liedersdorf, as vice counsel, uh, acted as a communications agent between the soldiers involved in the Bear Flag Revolt and the US government, excuse me. So he became a very important individual at that time. And, uh, once the Bear Flag Revolt was completed, he basically became the person who, one, translated uh, at, uh, Commander Slope's proclamation to the Mexican people that we were taking over, this is our territory now. And uh, he basically became a very important individual in terms of uh, notifying people across the state of California because he spoke Spanish, he was multilingual across California that this was happening. Uh, after the Americans uh, secured San Francisco secured the state of California. Liedersdorf went back uh, to his business activities, both in San Francisco and at Yerba Buena. And uh, he intended basically to continue those activities, but unfortunately for him, he passed away 
at the age of 38 from typhus. And uh, that left open a whole can of worms for a lot of people in San Francisco because Liesdorf, with all of his properties in San Francisco, with his properties in uh, Sacramento County, uh, basically uh, died childless, so he had no immediate heirs. So it was believed that uh, the property was up for grabs for anybody who could make a, a right deal for it. Unfortunately, it was uh, discovered uh, by people who did some detective work that Liedersdorf's family in San Croix was still alive and, and, and kicking. So he's, uh, agents uh, under Captain Joseph Libby Folsom, including Joseph Libby Folsom himself, dispatched themselves back to San Croix, uh, found the family, found the mother and three or four of the family, brothers and sisters, and basically uh, arranged a deal to buy his uh, Rancho Rio de, la, de los Americanos from them. And so a deal was struck that uh, they would uh, sell the property to, uh, fa uh, the family would sell the property to Captain Folsom for $75,000 to be paid in three different installments. Now think about it, $75,000 in 1850. That's a nice sum of money. <laughs> you know, people making money from gold mining weren't even uh, scratching that type of uh, surface in terms of uh, the, the wealth that could be uh, gotten as quickly as the family did. But one of the things that was, what happened as, in terms of uh, Liedendorf's, Liedendorf's family and their acceptance of the deal was word got back to them that because of mining sites like Negro Bar and Negro Hill and other, these other places that were using Liedendorf's land for gold mining purposes that um, hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe even millions of dollars of gold were being mined from that property. So they basically sued to get uh, the, the land back. And uh, after a lengthy process in which the uh, Supreme Court of, uh, of California ruled against them, uh, they basically couldn't get that property back. So uh, that property essentially belonged to Joseph Libby Folsom. And he basically uh, took the property and then went on about his business trying to make other deals for the properties that he had in San Francisco. Now, unfortunately for Joseph Libby Folsom, like Liedersdorf, he also died at the age of 38. <laughs> so there were two properties that needed to be uh, disposed of. So over, the, over a period of time, of course, the Folsom properties, along with the Liedersdorf properties that were owned by Liedersdorf were all disposed of. And it was, an estimate was given of the leaders' doors properties that the total value of those properties was right around $1.6 million. So in reality, leaders' door, a lot of him considered to be the first black millionaire in California. Uh, there was some truth to that, but leaders' doors property was so heavily encumbered that he probably wouldn't have joined the million, enjoyed the million of millions of dollars anyway. So, but anyway, that's another interesting sidelight of, of, of the roots running deep of, in terms of African Americans in. Uh, the Sacramento area. Next slide, please. Now this particular sign here, for those of you who might drive Highway 50, uh, you might've seen this sign. Uh, this sign is located right along the, uh, along on the eastern uh, bound, eastbound lanes of uh, Highway 50, uh, right around Bradshaw Road. And this particular sign was an effort uh, by uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Harris, who petitioned the California State Legislature to and Caltrans to put these signs in place. This sign here again is on the uh, eastbound lanes of Highway 50 leading away from Sacramento going towards Lake Tahoe. If you come back into Sacramento on the westbound lanes you'll find another sign like very like this one on the eastbound lanes uh, between El Dorado Hills and Folsom. As you make that grade down Folsom, you'll see that sign. These particular signs depict the eastern and western boundaries of Rancho Rio Still Americanos, roughly about 60 square miles. <laughs> so the cities of Folsom and Rancho Cordova make up a large portion of William Alexander Liedersdorf's original property. Next slide, please. Now these uh, gentlemen here, of course, these are uh, basically pictures that have been long in use in terms of, of depicting mining activity with uh, African-Americans in California. You can see it's a mixed group of uh, African-Americans and, and uh, Europeans uh, mining the sluice box, which was the next step up from pan mining and the gold fields at that time. This is taken about 1852. Next slide, please. 
And of course, this, this is probably the most famous of all gold mining pictures of African-Americans. It's called Andy at the Sluice. Um, and basically it's uh, a gentleman doing a sluice mining as well. And uh, you can tell he's got his equipment, his pans, his shovels, his, his basically in, in a little creek running behind it to wash out the, the gold deposits and the, and the other deposits that were gathering there to try to isolate the gold. So these, these are probably two of the most famous depictions of African-American gold mining uh, activities in California today. Next. Now this map here uh, was done by a gentleman by the name of jo uh, the late, the late Joseph Moore, uh, Lewis Moore, who was the husband of uh, Professor Shirley Moore, retired professor from Sac State, uh, professor of history at Sac State. And you can see that uh, these are actual mining sites that were associated with African-American mining activity. Um, and you'll notice too, that some of them contain a pejorative term that we don't necessarily want to repeat, that's what we have to repeat here, but these uh, mining sites carried all kinds of terms and, and names that uh, some of which were derogatory. In fact, uh, Negro Bar today, which is uh, uh, near Folsom, the city of Folsom, uh, basically in terms of popular culture was called uh, the N-word bar. And uh, it, uh, was, it was until the 1960s and under President Kennedy's uh, uh, presidency that the, uh, the department that's responsible for naming historic sites decided to get rid of all the derogatory term or terms as, or as many of them as they could because these terms were very uh, offensive not only to African-Americans but to Chinese, Japanese, uh, Native Americans and others. Uh, so a lot, a lot of these names that you see here now uh, are just reflections of the racism that was inherent in the mining communities at that time. And you can see also too that a couple of names like Rose's Bar, which is up near Marysville, which was a, once the site of slave on ac a slave activity in terms of slaves mining. Uh, uh, and there were others as well. well, we'll get to one in a few minutes. But also if you can see there's a Sweet Vengeance Mine, there's a, a Rare Ripe Gold and Silver Mining Company, We'll talk a little bit in detail about those in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. Now, an example of slavery in the mines was Kentucky Ridge Mine in Nevada, in Nevada County near uh, Bidley Springs, who operated for two years, 1851 and 1852, by a large number of slaves under the uh, ownership of William English. And of course, places like this drove free miners, free soil miners crazy. One, because it was uh, unfair competition uh, in terms of the number of people that were working the claim, the amount of gold that could be driven from the claim because of those numbers. So in some respects, they, uh, these were very highly resented by free soil mine, miners who were mostly white. And in some cases, like at Rose's Bar in, uh, in uh, also I think it was in Yuba County, they actually chased them, chased them and the slaves and their masters off the claim. So this is just an example here of, of some of that activity going on. And we never, we don't know today what happened with the slaves who were part of this particular expedition or uh, enterprise, but uh, it wasn't all that uncommon. And it all usually mostly happened in the early 1850s. Next slide, please. Now on the exact opposite term, we do find instances where African-Americans banded together, not only in terms of pan mining, but also in quartz mining, which became a later uh, form of mining activity, uh, which was more extractive in nature. And uh, it's called the Rare Ripe Gold and Silver Mining Company, located in uh, Browns Ravine in Yuba County. And it was an incorporated company. It was basically uh, funded by capital stock and, and shares were sold. And uh, you can see the, the prices of the shares in this particular case. And boards of trustees were set up to uh, basically manage the money and, and uh, proceeds that might have come from the mine. And in this board of trustees here, we have uh, a couple of names that I think are kind of significant. Edward P. Du e. P. Duplex, or Edward P. Duplex, secretary and treasurer, uh, who was later uh, became, after he be, uh, left the uh, mining industry, uh, became a barber uh, with a bar shop in Wheatland. He and his wife ran a, a barber shop and a, a beauty salon in Wheatland. And uh, he lived in Wheatland for a considerable amount of time. And, basically uh, became in 1888, the first mayor of a city 
uh, probably the first black mayor of a city in the United States in 1888. Uh, I don't know of any other instance where white people elected a, a black mayor <laughs> in any part of the country that I'm aware of. And so Edward P. Duplex, and there are uh, plaques I think up in um, uh, Wheatland today that honor his memory uh, as that particular official. So that's something that I think is pretty interesting. But again, this was the type, these were the types of people that California was attracting. Uh, people that were enterprising, free blacks that were enterprising and, and that were willing to uh, uh, use other means of getting uh, property and, and uh, wealth. Next slide, please. Now these, next I'll just show you uh, pictorial visions of what um, San Francisco, Sacramento and Stockton were like uh, in, 18, in 1840s and 1850s. And of course, this was Yerba Buena. This is what William Alexander Leidersdorf would have seen uh, from a boat or from a ship uh, at, uh, at a much later period than he arrived. Next, please. And of course, Stockton. Uh, this is Stockton Circle 1858. And you can see this kind of a panorama of views that are given in this photograph that give you an idea of what that particular city was like. And uh, the San Joaquin River with the riverboat in the middle. Uh, you know, there were no bridges going across any of these rivers at the time. So a lot of people had to use boats to get across any body of water that was a significant size. So uh, Sacramento being no exception. Oh, by the way, one story that I neglected to mention on uh, about Liedersdorf was the fact that he uh, bought a boat, a steamboat, from a Russian gentleman called the Sitka, and basically uh, based, sold, sailed the boat down the Sacramento River in uh, uh, 1847 with the intention of trying to show that steamboat uh, sailing was going to be the, the wave of the future. Unfortunately for him, the Sitka was a very small boat. It listed from side to side with nine or 10 people on it. And it took the Sitka basically six days plus to make the trip from San Francisco to, Sac uh, to Sacramento without capsizing <laughs> and without keeling over. So, but it was still his first uh, steamship to sail down the uh, Sacramento River from San Francisco. The Sitka was later taken back to San Francisco and refurbished, refurbished and made larger and it became known as the uh, Rainbow. And the Rainbow became a, a ship that did successfully navigate the Sacramento River numerous times as a sailing vessel and as a commercial boat. Next slide, please. And of course, Sacramento, which uh, is circa 1850. And you can see, of course, the commerce that takes place on the river there, uh, giving a clear picture of what uh, activities were going on at that time. I uh, don't know exactly what street this is pointing up, uh, but you can see there's not was not much of the city there at that time. Um, it's flooded, had fires numerous times, and was actually raised, I think, in 1862 or 63 uh, to prevent that from happening. And those were all great engineering feats that made the city more livable. Uh, Sacramento, of course, uh, at that time was uh, and that was not the capital of California at the time. At that time, the capital of California was probably Monterey, and then later Benicia. And Sacramento didn't become the capital of California until 1854. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, again, Sacramento County registered a total population of 240 free Black citizens in the 1850 census. This population was 81% male and 19% female. And over 90% of the Sacramento County population, 191 persons live within the boundaries of the city of Sacramento. So you can already see, uh, like the Gold Rush in general, the black population in Sacramento was overwhelmingly male. Next slide, please. Among the uh, Af uh, black people that uh, came to Sacramento in 1850, uh, they, occupied, they had a number of occupations and skills that they brought to the city. Um, in the 1850 census, there were 64 cooks, 24 washermen, 10 owners of boarding houses, two coffee house owners, four boarding house owners, and five blacksmiths. And all of these occupations and businesses that were developed at this time were to serve the gold mining community because that's what was going on. There was no really other activity that was going on uh, where you had as many customers available to you as those miners coming out of the mother load into Sacramento to get their basic needs, both physical and uh, commercial taken care of. So if you want to come get your hair cut, or if you want to come take a, a nice bath, get a nice hotel, 
um, if you could meet a woman if it was, if it was possible. But uh, if you if you have those intentions in mind, if you want to go to a good saloon uh, that had you know some sort of um, high class appeal to it, then you came to places like Sacramento or Stockton or Marysville to get that done because a lot of those weren't available in the mining communities that they uh, came out of. Next slide, please. And uh, basically what I put together was kind of a listing, or kind of an overview listing of the types of black owned establishments that were established in Sacramento between 1850 and 19, 1860. And this was kind of a small sampling I'm gonna give you here. And uh, you can see that we have a number of saloons, restaurants, uh, blacksmiths, uh, hairdressing salon, salons that were, again, catering to an overwhelmingly white uh, clientele that was male. And so Blacks in Sacramento or, and Blacks in California in general learned early on that most of their business activities were going to be uh, directed towards uh, Caucasians and others and, and, and uh, that if they wanted to uh, make sure their business was successful, then that, uh, that, they, this, this, that clientele had to be served the way uh, they needed to be served. So you can see some of these, op some of these businesses were uh, catering to that particular clientele. Next slide, please. And some other examples. Um, as you can see, uh, moving forward, there are other blacksmith shops. Laundries were particularly, uh, were particularly po you know, popular, of course. Uh, you, know, you had uh, people that could take care of your, your personal needs in terms of your laundry, in terms of your hair, in terms of your uh, well-being. Uh, plus come to get good food, uh, those were all available. So nothing really changes over hundreds of years. This, this is the same scenario could have been, you know, old England or old Scotland or someplace like that where people would go, go, go into this larger city to uh, be entertained. Next slide, please. Now, despite the fact that they were legally free under the California constitution, black men and women still face discriminatory practices on a daily basis. In the 1850s, uh, saw these discriminatory practices being codified into law, and those included the inability to testify against whites in local and state courts, the inability to vote in local, state, and national elections, but that was nationwide, of course, and the ability to attend schools with white children if other alternatives, such as all Black schools, were available. So that gives you an idea of where, that, uh, where they stood. Um, Next slide, please. Now, testimony laws were uh, passed by the legislature in 1851 under Section 394 of the Civil Practices Act of 1851 and Section 14 of the Civil uh, of the Criminal Act of 1851. And both statutes allowed the courts to discount or deny the testimony of black citizens in both civil and criminal cases involving black and white witnesses. Uh, next slide, please. To battle these discriminatory practices, Californians organized on a statewide scale. Now here, it was absolutely essential that this had to happen because the black communities in each city were so small that it was impossible for them to leverage the political and power structures of the time uh, and with those numbers. So as a statewide body, the numbers increased grad uh, drastically and their influence became more pronounced. And so uh, as a result, they hosted statewide color conventions in Sacramento in 1855 and 56, which were held at St. Andrew's African-American Episcopal Church, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and uh, in San Francisco in 1857. And as a result of these conventions, certain uh, activities and certain things and goals and objectives were outlined. Now, another thing that the African-American communities did at these conventions was to get a, a take or get a, a feeling for where they stood economically. So they took a survey of their communities and then came back to the convention with some numbers in terms of their basic wealth of each community. And so to take in together, the African-American community figured that with all their holdings and, and gold mine holdings and commercial holdings, farm holdings if they had them and other activities, that the entire black community of, Sac of, of California was worth right around $2.5 million. Now each county broke down their share of that in terms of their particular worth. And Sacramento County figured that their, their share was right around $250,000. So 
So depending on the size of your community, uh, you basically came up with the idea that you're worth at least that much money or that you're, you have that type of political clout. Now, the first black newspaper, the Mirror of the Times, was founded in 1856 and was led by a gentleman by the name of Mifflin Gibbs, who I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, it was a great thing to put together a, a newspaper because there was no real news coming back to the black community outside of the word of mouth about what was going on back east, about what was happening in other parts of California. So a newspaper was the very first thing that they did to try to solve that problem. And political groups such as the Franchise League and the Executive Committee were organized to try to make sure that uh, these activities were carried out. So the main strategy that these particular organizations would try to do to alleviate some of these discriminatory practices was to petition the state legislature which at that time was made up of a lot of Southern Democrats <laughs> to try to overturn some of these adverse uh, discriminatory practices. So these efforts and uh, were organized and led by men and women such as, Lakes, next slide. Mifflin Gibbs, native of Little Rock, Arkansas, who made his way to California uh, in 1849. and was a businessman, political activist, and the publisher of the Mirror of the Times. And uh, he lived in San Francisco and he ran with a gentleman by the name of Peter Lester, a shoe store uh, that sold boots. And Mifflin, Mifflin Gibbs and Peter Lester became the plaintiffs in one of the earliest discrimination seats, suits uh, that occurred in California. It actually really wasn't a discrimination suit, it was actually a criminal case where a gentleman walked into their, a white gentleman walked into their shoe store, tried on some boots and walked out. Well, Peter Lester chased the gentleman out, out of his store demanded the boots back and the gentleman turned around and, get, and, and beat him up. <laughs> so Mifflin Gibbs and Peter Lester sued uh, the gentleman in court. And uh, basically their testimony was thrown out because of the testimony law. So that intensified Mifflin Gibbs uh, basic ambition to get rid of that, um, that, that particular law. And so he was joined by others uh, like the executive committee and others to as a result of the uh, state conventions to try to overturn this. Next slide, please. Mary Ellen Pleasant. Uh, many people know her by the name of Mammy Pleasant, which is again, one of those things that happens with African-American women this time. But Mary Ellen Pleasant was an abolitionist, businesswoman, civic leader in 19th century San Francisco. She used her influence and capital to assist in the freeing of slaves in California and other states. And she's considered by many to be the mother of early civil rights the early civil rights movement in California, and uh, is believed by many, if not outright confirmed, to be one of the major funders of uh, abolitionist John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry uh, in 1859, in the uh, first real uh, insurrection to try to free slaves, uh, armed insurrections to try to free slaves uh, in the United States, aside from slavery, slavery and also themselves. Uh, but Mary Ellen Pleasant basically helped bankroll a lot of the activities uh, that African Americans undertook to overturn discriminatory practices in California. Even in her later life, uh, she was denied uh, 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 a seat on a, a tram in San Francisco. She sued the uh, cable car company for denying her the seat. The case reached the California Supreme Court in which she won a small settlement but it wasn't enough to satisfy her. And so she left kind of frustrated from that particular case. But she was just an example of the women that were involved in this movement as well. And uh, again, she's a very important and influential figure in the history of California. And she, she also was uh, very prominent in some of the uh, early slave cases as well, like Archie Lee and others. Next slide, please. Now, the next leg of the stool of, of dealing with these was the formation of fraternal organizations. In addition to uh, leadership uh, formed by individuals such as Mary Ellen Pleasant and Mifflin Gibbs, African-American men and women organized fraternal organizations to enhance the level of cooperation and the unity between the men and women from varying backgrounds and experiences. And the earliest of these organizations charted under the Prince Hall Masonic Order, and the Prince Hall Masonic Order was the Black Masonic Order that was chartered uh, through the English uh, uh, Masonic Orders back in the uh, 1700s, it was the Hannibal Lodge of San Francisco number one, organized in 1852 in San Francisco, the Philomethia Lodge number two in Sacramento, uh, organized in 1853, and the Oakland Lodge of Oakland, organized in 
uh, also in 1853. In 1855, these three lodges joined together to convene a grand lodge of free and accepted nations for the state of California. And what these Masonic lodges did was basically act as both uh, uh, benevolent organizations and also uh, political organization, not politi quasi political organizations to bring together African Americans to fight uh, uh, against discriminatory practices. And a lot of these members of these organizations were also members of the executive committee and the franchise league, which I earlier pointed out. Next slide, please. Now, all of these, of course, all these chapters and the women's chapters that later arose out of the uh, Masonic orders, the uh, Order of the Eastern Star chapters, like the Ada chapter of uh, Eastern uh, Order of the Eastern Orders, East Order of the Eastern Star that arose in 1861. All of these, uh, basically, these groups were uh, used to galvanize the effort against discriminatory practices uh, throughout the state. An interesting statistic here that I wanted to point out was in terms of literacy, African American women had a literacy rate of 74%, which was well above the average for most ethnic groups at that time. I, I say all, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was really most. Uh, I think Africa, uh, the white literacy rate at that time was about 89%. Now, the literacy rate of slaves, illiteracy rate of slaves was 80%, 80%. So to have women arrive in California uh, with the literacy rate of 74% was a, of a good fortune beyond words because with having a literacy rate, you were able to articulate your grievances to the powers that be in a way that made sense to the courts, in a way that made sense to anybody that could arbitrate your, your cases. And uh, these women also were very influential in forming literary societies, social clubs, and other organizations that assisted the men or that in some cases uh, guided the men or in some cases even told the men <laughs> what they needed to do to get things done. So black women in many cases were more than enough of an equal to the men that, they, uh, that were their husbands or their brothers or their sons and making sure that they got these things done. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we're gonna start talking somewhat about the churches that were founded here. And I uh, wanted to tell you about the uh, African-American Episcopal Church, the St. Andrew's AME Church, as it later became known as, it was first known as the Colored Church of Sacramento, then became Bethel AME Church, and then eventually St. Andrew's AME Church. It was founded in 1850 uh, by a congregation uh, that first met in the home of Daniel Blue and Lucinda Blue. And you can see uh, in this document here, which is part of the Sacramento History, History Block Map, Daniel Blue's house was located on I Street between 4th and 5th Streets. And you can see his name highlighted in the, uh, the second plot over, one of the longer ones there. And Daniel Blue was an African-American gentleman who came to California in 1849 with his wife. And they bought property early on. And uh, as you can see, uh, you can see some of the people living around him at the time. One of the things that is particularly interesting that you might find very interesting, who lives right next door to Daniel Blue, if you look on the lower left of that plot map, you'll see the name Peter Burnett. Now, <laughs> Peter Burnett was the uh, first governor elected to, Cal to California in 1849. He was governor of California from 1849 to 1851. And basically that was a time when California was transitioning from being a territory to being a state uh, in 1850. Uh, and then Peter Burnett, of course, uh, spent his last year as governor in 1851. Peter Burnett, of course, was born in Nashville, Tennessee, moved to, uh, I think it was uh, Missouri, uh, his uh, adult life, and then made his way to Oregon where he became a judge uh, or a legislator in Oregon. And Peter Burnett uh, in his life uh, owned slaves and uh, went to Oregon. And basically when as a part of the legislature there uh, drafted and had passed uh, exclusion acts that excluded African uh, blacks from coming into the state of Oregon. And so Peter Burnett 
base, uh, took his knowledge that he acquired uh, from being a legislator in Oregon, came to California in 1849 and uh, applied that knowledge <laughs> to drafting and signing bills that sought to exclude people of color from the state of California. Now he was never successful in having a bill passed or signed that excluded African-Americans from California. That was uh, basically not a, a done deal because at the Con Constitutional Convention of Monterey uh, was discovered that if they included such a clause in their uh, package to the US, uh, to the United States Congress, they would never be allowed to enter the union because Missouri went to the same experience uh, earlier, a few years before that. And so the Missouri had to change their exclusion clause, get rid of it. California had to get rid of their exclusion clause in order to become a state. So California came into the state in 1850 as a free state. But that didn't stop Peter Burnett from still <laughs> trying. So over time, as a legislator, as a governor, he sought to basically pull together as much of the anti-Black, anti-foreign minors, anti-Asian uh, activity as he could. So it's, I find it remarkable that he and Daniel Blue live in such proximity because in the, <laughs> that, uh, that's one of the mind blowing things about uh, Sacramento in terms of its diversity, in terms of proximity of people to people. This of course is a photograph of Daniel Blue that was uh, donated uh, by his uh, granddaughter, great granddaughter, Lola Reed. And you can see he's a very distinguished looking gentleman. But again, the African-American Episcopal Church first met at his home in uh, 18, uh, 49 and established a church in 1850. And St. Andrew's AME Church is the oldest African-American congregation on the Pacific coast. Uh, I don't know if there's any other west of the Mississippi really that's older, but uh, we do know that that designation holds for the Pacific coast. Next slide, please. Now, the early black churches of California, and you can see the, the, the order here in terms of uh, when these churches were founded and where they were located. And if you notice, uh, Sacramento, San Francisco, Stockton, you kind of expect that because of the black populations there. Marysville, you kind of expect because Marysville had a sizable uh, population of African-Americans. What you really don't expect today is to find black churches in Grass Valley or, uh, or as many or Chico. But churches were established in all these areas and except for the Grass Valley Church, uh, pretty much all these churches still exist. These congregations still exist. The Grass Valley Church um, was basically disbanded or just uh, right around the uh, teen years, I think, because the black population just didn't have enough black population to keep it going. But all these other churches that you see here, uh, all the way down the line, still exist. And they're both Baptist and AME churches. And uh, those are the two denominations that were dominant and prevalent in California at that time. Next slide, please. And this is a photograph of a, the St. Andrew's AME Church uh, that was taken uh, in the years between 1869 and 1951. And looking from that car that's parked, in, those cars that are parked by it, you can tell it's probably taken in the 20s or 30s. This particular building was constructed in 1869. Uh, before that, there was a wooden building uh, that the church occupied that was the home of the colored conventions that I mentioned earlier and where all this great stuff happened. And so uh, this church lasted uh, from that period. And uh, later on, the congregation in 1951 moved to their current location on the corner of 8th and V Streets, right across the street from Southside Park. And there's a plaque at that church uh, denoting, a uh, cornerstone denoting that uh, St. Andrew's is the uh, oldest black church and also listed on the state historic landmarks uh, listing of the state of California. Next slide, please. And this is the plaque that was put in place in January, 1995, uh, uh, state landmark number uh, 1013. That gives you a little bit of the history of the church, the significance, and uh, again, very, uh, a very important landmark in Sacramento's history in terms of not only being a church and a religious institution, but also being a, a gathering place for a lot of different activities. Uh, St. Andrews has, uh, in more recent years, 
was involved in early civil rights activity uh, regarding discrimination on public housing because the new church that exists now on V Street, 8th and V Streets was not too far from the New Hill Bisha housing project. And Nathaniel Colley uh, utilized members from that church to help him in filing the lawsuit uh, that basically got the uh, Sacramento Housing Authority to overturn some discriminatory practices against African-Americans that were occurring in that housing project in the early 50s. So St. Andrews still continues today to uh, play an important role in the uh, fight against discrimination in Sacramento. Next slide, please. Now here's a rendering that was done uh, of the Chinese Baptist Chapel on the corner of 6th and 8th Street. And this was the first site of worship for the congregation, black congregation of the Siloam, which was later named Shiloh Baptist Church in 1856. And uh, this church has an interesting, interesting history in and of itself too, which uh, I won't get into now, but uh, it tells you something about the influence of missionaries in the Chinese communities, not only in, in America, but also in China, which this church here uh, had connections to. Next slide, please. This is a photo of Reverend Charles Satchel, who founded the uh, Shiloh Baptist Church, Salome Baptist Church in 1856. And uh, Reverend Satchel founded, uh, was also a, member, a minister of the Third Baptist Church, which was the oldest Black Baptist Church in San Francisco. And he would go back and forth uh, to Sac uh, Sac between Sacramento and San Francisco to minister. And it wasn't until 1861 that St. Andrews, uh, excuse me, uh, Shiloh got its own minister, uh, Reverend J.W. Flowers. And that enabled them to uh, raise the money eventually to build a structure of their own on the corners of um, N Street between 6th and 5th uh, Streets. Next slide, please. And these are some highlights of the uh, Shiloh Baptist Church in the 19th century. And uh, you can read that there. Purchased their 1860, purchased their firm own building, 5th and O. Uh, fire destroyed that building in 1861. And, uh, a group called the United uh, Sons of Friendship was organized as well. And the United Sons of Friendship, again, played a crucial role in the church's survival in 1871 when it paid off a, a defaulted loan uh, to San, uh, Sacramento Savings Bank. And they, the group purchased the property and uh, returned the church back to solvency. 1891, it officially changed its name to Shiloh Baptist Church and, and was fully incorporated by the state of California November 29th, 1898. Now Shiloh was interesting because in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, it became more prominent and was uh, a lightning rod for the publication of two more uh, African-American newspapers in Sacramento in uh, the 19 teens uh, that uh, basically covered activities in Sacramento. Not to the same extent as the earlier black newspapers in San Francisco, like the mayor of the Times, the Pacific Appeal and the Elevator did, but uh, they still uh, gave some people some insights on what was going on in Sacramento at that time. Next slide. Now we're gonna get into the uh, school issue. And uh, we you see here is Elizabeth Scott Thorne. And she was the first African-American teacher or instructor here in Sacramento, uh, a native of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, she arrived in Sacramento uh, in, 1850s, in the 1850s, and uh, she taught uh, the first African-American all-Black school uh, in Sacramento in May of 1890, uh, 1854. And the school was first taught in her home um, in, in, uh, in O Street, and then later on uh, she moved it to the basement of the uh, church, uh, African-American Episcopal Church, St. Andrews. And then uh, in 1855, she married a gentleman named Isaac Flood, and then uh, she later moved to Oakland. But she continued to uh, go back and forth between Sacramento and Oakland to uh, teach the school. And she taught the school until uh, 1857, and then uh, she moved to Oakland permanently. And uh, then she passed away in uh, 1867 at the age of 39. And, uh, and she didn't get the chance to see her daughter uh, receive an integrated education in Oakland's first integrated school in 1872. So again, one of the tragedies of uh, being a black uh, woman in California. But she, you know, she 
was really a pivotal per portion of getting uh, African-American students in California taught. She did it on her own time and with the support of the parents and, and she's to be commended for her role in that. Next slide, please. Next gentleman that we're gonna highlight is uh, Jeremiah B. Sanderson, who is the father, is considered to be the father of black education in California. Also a, also a uh, native of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Very interesting that New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is the hotbed of abolitionism, is contributing all these people to California to become involved in the uh, struggles uh, on the West, in the Western United States. Uh, he was a protege, Mr. Anderson, uh, uh, Sanderson was a protege of Frederick Douglass, knew Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass was the one who basically uh, encouraged him to come to California to help out the, uh, the communities in the West Coast. So he ended up in San Francisco first and uh, opened up a black school there in third, at the Third Baptist Church and taught there for a short time. And then he made his way to Sacramento and uh, basically uh, got to know Elizabeth Scott Thorne and uh, Flood and uh, got involved with the parents at, the, at that school. And then when uh, Mrs. Flood left, uh, Reverend Sanderson took up the lead in making sure, one, that the school that they attended was publicly funded. So he basically wrote a letter to the Board of Education in Sacramento, petitioning them to fund the public school because no one's, the, the, the parents are paying for everything. And this was supposedly a public school. So this shows you the disarray that the education system in California was in, and Sacramento was in at that time, because even before this happened, you know, children were at a point in, in the early 1850s where nobody was getting educated, kids were running around wild and crazy and loose. So people were, and parents basically were not, didn't trust uh, people they didn't know to teach their kids, and basically taught them at home, or some parents just believed it was better for their kids to stay at home rather than to go to school because they can earn money that was sorely needed at that time. So when the public school system was being started, they had to work through all of that. But once they did work through all of that, uh, in terms of figuring out who to tax, uh, how to raise the funds to, to start public schools, once they figured all that out, they still determined that they wanted segregated schools. No Blacks, no Asians, no Native Americans. They wanted them all white. So as a result, black parents were frustrated. So that put it upon themselves to go take it upon themselves to get their kids educated. So hence we have Elizabeth Scott Thorne and Jeremiah B. Sanderson. And Jeremiah B. Sanderson, after he went to the board meeting to read his letter to the uh, Board of Education in 1854, stated uh, that he would be more than happy to take on the teaching role at that school. And so the board considered it and they granted his wish and they gave him a stipend, a very low stipend, of course, because African-Americans even then, even if they were teachers are getting paid way less than white teachers at the time, but he didn't mind, he didn't bother him. His basic goal and objective was to teach African-American kids. So, uh, so Dr. Sanderson took up the mantle and taught at the school uh, for African-American students um, into up until the uh, right around 1860 uh, or so. And then he would go form other schools in Stockton and I think even in Marysville. Now the school that he taught in Stockton eventually attracted students from as far south as Los Angeles because his reputation as a teacher was so magnificent that people in Los Angeles were hearing about it and they would actually send their kids to Stockton to be educated because they were going through the same issues down in Southern California that they had. So Jeremiah B. Sanderson is called the father of black education in California for a very good reason. Next. And here's a photograph of the uh, colored school number two uh, that was uh, an extension of the school that was founded earlier uh, by um, Elizabeth Thorne Scott Flood and Jeremiah B. Sanderson. And this school is located on the corner, excuse me, on the 9th and O Streets in Sacramento. And it's really interesting how this property was acquired because uh, the school had undergone a few iterations uh, at that time and black parents were being asked by the school board to supply most of the revenue for the school support. 
And black parents felt this was unfair because white schools were receiving not only the revenue from white the parents that donated, but also from the school board itself in larger numbers. So they felt this situation was just untenable. What are we gonna do? So they basically found property and in the middle streets, uh, built a new school building, got the school board to fork over some additional funding for it. And then um, with a series of teachers that have, uh, came and went between the years uh, uh, 1865 or so to uh, 1873, uh, they kept the school alive, but always with one eye on closing because they had uneven days that kids were going to school, the whole night. Think of, think of the pandemic and how, this, how the pandemic has affected education. That's kind of the way the schools were being run back then, you know, with, with uh, uneven closings and when are we gonna get back to school? Can our kids go to school? These are the same concerns black parents had on a daily basis for, you know, 20 years in terms of getting their kids educated. So uh, eventually uh, a woman named, by the name of Sarah Mildred Jones arrived in Sacramento in 1873. And she was uh, a Missouri native who was uh, educated at Oberlin College in Ohio. And Oberlin College is one of the few institutions religious institutions run by whites that educated African-Americans, the other being Wilberforce University, also in Ohio. So uh, a number of Ohio Oberlin graduates, some of the ministers, like the early ministers in California were Oberlin graduates. Oberlin was an outstanding institution at that time. So Sarah Mills Jones arrived in 18, uh, 19, uh, 1973 and took over the uh, school. And her primary function, because she knew that her kids could get into all white schools, but at some point, because of the pressure that black parents were putting on the school board to integrate was going to uh, was be, being more and more effective. She understood that eventually th that dam was going to break and that white black students would be admitted. So she made it her task between eight, 1873 and 1880 when the school board finally agreed to integrated schools totally without question, without conditions. She made sure that any black student coming out of her school would be prepared to go to that all white school. With no, with no question from any academics or any uh, politicians about their qualifications. In fact, uh, before the black students started going to all white schools, they were slowly allowed to trickle in one or two at a time. And each one of those students that trickled in up during that period was tested. And those tests were examined by not only board members, but also politicians. And they found that those students at Sarah Mildred Jones educated were as qualified and as smart and as uh, adept at their academics as any of the other students in class. So a lot of these barriers were slowly and surely broken away under the strategy incorporated by Sarah Mildred Jones. Next slide, please. And this is a quote of, of, of the, probably the most well-known picture of Sarah Mildred Jones that we have. Uh, and this was taken circa 1900 and uh, shows her uh, in that particular light uh, she became an educator and was eventually taken in under the uh, school board to teach uh, under their system uh, by the uh, late 1880s and um, assumed a principalship at Fremont School on the corner of 24th and N Streets, which still is the building still exists. Uh, you go by there now, it's the Clara, which is a performing arts, uh, uh, performing arts training facility. And uh, you can see that uh, she taught there from 1894 to 1915. Interesting enough, when she was first appointed, there was, there was some white parents who opposed her appointment and they pressured the school board to uh, reiterate or take back or rescind her appointment. And there were the school board under the pressure of the white parents felt that they probably had bitten off more than they could choose. So they actually did rescind her appointment. But Sarah Mildred Jones uh, got support from teachers at Sacramento High School and from the larger community and from black parents and that petition campaign that they put on got her reinstated to the princess principalship. And uh, once she was reinstated, she was there for the, for the duration that you notice on that slide. So, uh, and she's probably the first principal of an integrated school um, on the West Coast, or maybe even farther back. We just don't know the, the extent yet, but it's a significant accomplishment, let's put it that way. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to a little bit of this guy here, Beckworth, Jim Beckworth. You talk about frontiersmen, pioneers. 
Jim Beckwith's, uh, I call him the Forrest Gump of the, of the West. <laughs> because when you look at what Jim Beckwith was involved with in terms of his uh, experience as both a scout, as both a uh, trader, as both a uh, uh, Kit Carson-like uh, wild man, so to speak, uh, going to various parts of the uh, Wild West at that time in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. He started with the uh, Ashley Expedition in 1826 as a teenager. His father, uh, basically, he was a white man. His mother was, was, was a black. And uh, his, his father was a, an officer in the Revolutionary War uh, back in uh, uh, Maryland, where he was born. But they didn't feel that was conducive for the interracial relationship that uh, uh, they were his, he and his wife, his, his woman were involved in. So they moved to St. Louis and Jim was raised in St. Louis primarily. And then uh, at, a, at the age of about 16, he got into an altercation with a gentleman and his father spirited him away and had him join William Ashley's expedition. Now this expedition included uh, Kit Carson, Jedediah Smith, uh, uh, Jim Kleiman, the, uh, who's, it was a who named a who's who of explorers and uh, uh, mountain men, and trappers and traders. Jim learned from all these guys. And uh, he basically uh, went into the uh, Montana region, Wyoming region with that particular expedition. So it was captured by the Crow Indians. Uh, and the only reason he wasn't killed at the time he was captured was because a, a, a Crow woman thought she, he was a long lost relative who had grown up and that's him, that's him. And so Jim definitely breathed a sigh of relief that he wasn't killed that day. But he stayed with the Crow Indians for about two years. And then he ended up leaving them and uh, making his way to Florida where he fought in the Seminole War, which was a war between uh, Andrew Jackson, the United States and the Seminole Nation. And later uh, ended up becoming a uh, participant in the Battle of Cohengua, which is why he came to California, which was the, made the major battle uh, that allowed California to defeat the Californios in 1845. He was a courier in the Mexican War in 1848 a participant in the California Gold Rush, which was this, you know, in 1850. And uh, that was the same year he discovered the Beckworth Pass, which we'll talk about in a bit. And a scout for the Colorado militia that took part in the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864, which is probably the most infamous, most uh, ridiculously demeaning massacre that Indian uh, peoples ever experienced, uh, aside from the Wounded Knee Massacre later in uh, 1896. But, uh, and uh, he would later die in a Crow Indian village near the Bighorn River in 1866. So again, that's why I call him the Forrest Gump. You can see the range of activities that he undertook as a, uh, as a scout and as a, as a chief. But anyway, uh, in California, uh, Jim Beckworth's claim to fame, of course, his major claim to fame is his founding of the Beckworth Pass. Next slide, please. In the Sierra Nevada. Oh, I'm sorry, did I? Uh, go, 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 slide. Next slide, over. next slide, yeah, there you go. Uh, we'll go back to that slide in a second. Anyway, this Beckworth Pass is the lowest pass over the Sierra Nevada mountains at 5,221 feet. And as you can see, when it enters, when it enters California, it enters a little town called Chilkoot, which is not listed on this particular map. But you see it goes along what is now Highway 70. In fact, Highway 70 is pretty much an exact approximation of Beckworth Pass. And I don't know how many people that are listening or watching have been on Highway 70, but it is absolutely one of the most beautiful drives you could take in Northern California if you drive the full length of it. And you can see that uh, the towns of Portola and Quincy, uh, they're probably the major towns and cities along that. And you can see that it makes its way all the way to Marysville, excuse me, to Oroville. But when Jim Beckworth was using this pass, he would take people all the way to Marysville because Highway 70 does continue into Marysville. And Jim Beckworth uh, thought he was going to be paid handsomely for the first expedition of people, uh, overland expedition of people he took to Marysville. But when he got to Marysville, Marysville had burned down. <laughs> so the, the money that he was promised was never paid. And so Jim basically had to eat that one. But on his first, the first trip that he took across the Beckworth Pass was in 1851. And that expedition, the wagon train included uh, Ina Coolbrook, who was 
uh, a young woman at the time, I think she was 10 years old. And uh, she later became uh, a writer and a poet. And she was California's first poet laureate. Um, and she's a very well-known figure in the literary community. And uh, she recalls that her uh, riding with Jim Beckwith, because Jim Beckwith put her on, her on his horse and they rode from the point uh, where the California border is uh, clear to uh, Marysville. She recalls riding with him on his horse and being regaled by the stories that he told her about his experiences. Because Jim Beckwith was a typical mountain man. He exaggerated everything, I'm sure. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, this family here is another example of families that uh, were separated. Uh, it's a Gooch Monroe family. Uh, Nancy and Peter Gooch. Now, this is the Monroe family here that we're seeing in terms of the actual family. But um, the Gooch Monroe family, uh, Nancy and Peter Gooch came to California in 1850 as slaves. Uh, and they basically were settled into uh, Coloma, California. And they were freed shortly after. And uh, before Nancy and Peter came, they were separated from their children, from her son. Uh, and um, they uh, basically tried to raise money to get him back before slavery ended, but they never did. So after slavery ended, uh, um, Nancy Gucci was still alive, uh, sought to get her son back. So she had made enough money as a seamstress, as a laundress, to uh, send back for him and his family. And they all came out in the 1870s and they settled in Coloma, one of four black families that settled Coloma during this period. And so uh, the area that uh, the Gucci settled was right next to Sutter's Mill, where gold was discovered. And so the family uh, got to know James Marshall discoverer of gold who had become kind of an eccentric in the area and all this stuff. So they got to know him and became friends with his because he was like, you know, you can imagine what kind of stories he told <laughs> of the gold rush and all that. And when James Marshall died, um, uh, the Monroe family, this, uh, the father and the sons buried him and uh, 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 at, in Coloma. And so there were three or four families, the Monroe family, the uh, Burgess family, the uh, Julian family, and the Wilson family. And those four families became the four black families of Coloma. And uh, they uh, you know, lived in that area for you know, years and years. And uh, there's another story that I'll tell later on about another family that uh, will end this particular presentation. But if you take the next slide, please. This is kind of a family tree of the, uh, the Monroe family. And uh, you can see uh, Peter Gooch and Nancy Gooch and then Andrew Monroe, the son, and his wife, Susan, who they bought back from Missouri. And, uh, and the kids of Andrew and Sarah. And uh, the oldest, uh, the last survivor was James Leonard Monroe, who lived to be 102 years old. And then Pearlie Monroe, and then, uh, so you can see there are varying life, uh, lifespans here, reflective of life in the old West, <laughs> or life at that time. Um, the Monroe family ended up buying or purchasing 80 acres of land around their house, around their homestead. Um, eventually that 80 acres, which included Sutter's Mill and some other portions of it, uh, became part of what is now known as the Marshall Discovery State Park which commemorates uh, not only the gold, the founding of gold in California, and it's one of the more popular uh, sites that are there that the state parks has. A lot of that was bought through eminent dom or either through money or through eminent domain from the Monroe, Monroe family. Uh, Pearlie Monroe, the last, uh, so, uh, next to the last survivor of the family, died in 1963, regretted that he could have that he didn't get paid more for the property uh, by the state and that so much of it was taken by eminent domain, but you know who knows why those types of things have happened, but he always believed and probably rightfully so that uh, he was probably rooked out of the money to a certain extent because he was black. So, uh, but uh, again, there's a commemorative trail at Marshall Gold Discovery State Park called the Monroe Trail that kind of 
skirts the property that goes through the property because they grew orchards, orchard, uh, orchard uh, fruits and vegetables of all kinds that they sold in the open market in Coloma and other parts of Placer County and uh, made themselves quite proper, prosperous and self-sufficient. So another story of, of slavery and the influence of family and, and uh, how people come band together. Next. And this is a later picture of Pearlie Monroe uh, taken in 1962, right about a year before he died. Next. There's a house that Pearlie Monroe built. Uh, he also had a black, uh, they also had a blacksmith shop and some other uh, activities that he partook of, to participate in while he was in Coloma uh, the entire time he was there. And uh, this house is still uh, extant and standing and part of the uh, tour of the, of the uh, park. Next. Now, the last little connection I want to make here is, is uh, the Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Colony, which was the first Japanese settlement in the United States. And it was uh, near Colum the Coloma area, just a little bit up, not too far from there. And it was, of course, founded uh, by a gentleman by the name, last name Schnell. He recruited some Japanese to come to California to raise. Uh, silk worms and plant tea and uh, with the hope of having that be an enterprising event that can make money for not only him but also for the uh, immigrants that came with him. Unfortunately, that enterprise uh, didn't work out. It uh, lasted about two years and then just kind of died away. So a lot of the immigrants ended up leaving or going back to Japan. Um, one lady, one young lady by the name of they called her OK, O-K-E-I, was about 19 years old. Uh, she stayed behind and uh, stayed with the Chanel family. Uh, she ended up passing away at the age of 19. And so eventually, the only person that was really left of the original immigrants was a gentleman that, that's pictured here, uh, Kunisuke uh, Masumisu. Uh, a lot of people called him Kuni at the time. Now, Kuni, uh, basically, after the colony died, uh, decided to make his uh, fortune in, California. So he left Coloma, made his way up to, I think it was uh, Oroville or Calusa, that area, up, that area up in there in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, understood just by observation that he was Asian and that uh, the Chinese and, and the, were, weren't getting treated very well. So he, he basically passed himself off, off as a Native American <laughs> when necessary. If confronted by people that he wasn't comfortable with, he was Native American. If he felt comfortable with people, then he revealed his Chinese, his, his Japanese ancestry. Uh, so he lived that life for a number of years. He ended up marrying a black woman by the name of Carrie Wilson, who was one of the children of the Coloma, one of the black Coloma families. And they had uh, a family together. And um, next slide, please. And that family, uh, produced uh, Afro-Japanese children uh, who later became uh, associated with the Elbeck family, a black family called the Elbeck family. And uh, so for about 100 years, 100 year, 100 year anniversary of the founding of the colony, the Japanese American community wanted to know what happened to these people, what happened to the colonists. So for whatever, however, whatever means they applied, they ended up finding the descendants the last living descendants of the Japanese American families, of Japanese uh, descendants of the Wakamatsu Tea Colony ended up living in Oak Park. <laughs> and they were the Elbeck family. And uh, this article that was done in LA Times, um, and I can't quite see the, the year there. I think it was 1990. 1970, March 30th, 1970. 1970, okay, thank you, 1970. Anyway, the LA Times did an article on the story and found out that the last remaining descendants of the Wakamatsu Tea Colony were, were Afro-Japanese. And during the, in the story, the descendants told uh, the reporter that he never told them he was Japanese. He always told, always told them that he was Native American. So they were just as surprised as anybody else to find out that they had Japanese ancestry. So it's one of these types of stories that kind of highlight the diversity of California and why uh, California is such a great state to, to live in. And uh, oh, by the way, the one more slide, please. 
And this is the last slide. And this is a, a photograph of uh, Clara Bergens, who was the woman that was shown in the middle of that particular article in the picture there. And this is her picture that was taken in 2007 in a later article, the B. Uh, uh, you know, story. And that's it. Any, uh, any questions? I realize an important thing that is missing from this is the applause. <laughs> just, you. You're going to have to expect that it's out there. And I thank you very much, uh, Clarence, for the, the talk. And, uh, and I was going to uh, open it for questions if, if you've got the time. Uh, sure, no question. No problem. Lots, of, lots of compliments. And uh, uh, first question to start off with is somebody, uh, you alluded to James Beckworth. And there was a question about any records or accounts that discuss the population of people of African descent before 1849? Um, well, the only African people of African descent before 1849, uh, there were, you know, again, uh, there were explorers that came through that didn't stay, like Peter Rene, who came with the Jedediah Smith uh, expedition in 1827 and, 20, and 27 and 28, but he didn't live here. The only people of African ancestry that were here were the African Mexican Californios who lived primarily along the coast of California from San Diego up to San Francisco. And the reason they were called uh, Californios and the reason they were African Mexicans is because in 1790, the Spanish, uh, the Spanish uh, government did a census and they classified each person in that census by a racial classification that was used in Latin America. So if you were 100% black, African, uh, you were called a Negro, black, Negro. If you were mulatto, half black and half white, you were called a mulatto. And then uh, if you were half uh, Spanish and half Mex uh, Indian, you were called a mestizo. And then they had real fine other distinctions uh, that exemplified different mixes. Coyote, for instance, which is probably a person who was mixed with about three, two or three different blends of racial uh, genetic uh, genes. So those would be the only people that you could say were of African descent in California at that time. And also another thing that I think you might find real interesting about these particular Californios was that if you look at the lands and land grants that they got, for instance, the Pico family, the Reyes family, the uh, Tapia family, uh, they own some of the prime, most prime real estate in Southern California. Pico family, for instance, owned pretty much all of Northern San Diego County <laughs> and uh, Rancho Los Alamitos, uh, the Tapia family, if I'm not mistaken, um, owned uh, parts of Long Beach and others. No, that would be the, that would be the uh, Quintero family on Long Beach and uh, uh, that area in there. Um, I think it was the Tapias that owned Malibu, and that area up in there. So, you know, if you're talking about prime real estate, these Afro-Mexican Californios owned billions of dollars worth of property by today's standards. So um, our, roots, our, our roots run deep in, in California in that regard. And you are receiving uh, lots of comments of applause, literally applause for the for the sure. for your presentation. Uh, uh, someone who had the privilege of reading your excellent thesis asks if it's going to be published and available to everyone. That's a work in progress, and I can't tell you what the timetable would be. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, we, we work. I'm working on it. It's, it's it's in fact, I'm doing something now. <clears throat> that broadens the scope to uh, the entire Central Valley. And uh, that's kind of where my attention has been focused in the last few years, trying to get that together. And it's becoming a little more difficult in terms of being able to get to resources because of the COVID and all of the other stuff. But uh, yeah, I wanna, in fact, I'm expanding it to include um, the Central Valley and the Eastern Foothills, that mother load area as well. Yeah, I somehow I figure out Historian doesn't really retire. You're always seeking oh new nuances. <laughs> <laughs> you can say you're retired, but you're not really. Uh, someone asked and uh, suggests this is later in chronology about mm -hmm. the name Mark Teamer. Mark Teamer. 
Yeah, that's that's for yeah for later later presentation. That's the Black okay. Panther Party. Uh, okay, so that's we'll, later. Yeah, more modern. That'll be the yeah. talking history sometime yeah. in the future. Yeah, okay. yeah, sometime some in the future. We can talk. We can talk about that. Was there a state or section of the United States from which many African Americans came to California in the 19th century? Was there predominantly uh, a place? Yeah, the free the free Black populations came from primarily the uh, what we call a Northeast Corridor. Uh, from uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts on down to, I would say, uh, Maryland. Uh, one, because those are those states that, out, states that outlawed slavery and most of, uh, most of the black population that was free. Uh, Pennsylvania would be another one, but primarily the, uh, the middle, the middle uh, mid, mid East states, I would call New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. So you see a lot of those, a lot of those names there, in terms of where they came from. And we know that because uh, the earlier census is asking them to put where they're obviously where they were from. And so, uh, especially in the earliest years of the Gold Rush. And that's and that's what we and that's what we again that's what we had the literate leadership that we had here that could pull together with the things that the small population did in terms of you know uh, political. And so, by the way, one thing I forgot to, to note was that the testimony laws were overturned uh, by the passage of the Perkins Act in 1863. By that time, the uh, California legislature had become Republican. And today, that's a much different meaning <laughs> today, because that was truly the party of Lincoln in those days. But uh, the Republican uh, legislature, dominated legislature, overturned the testimony laws. The uh, voting laws uh, were overturned, of course, by the 15th Amendment of the Constitution that was passed in 1870. And the uh, laws against slavery, of course, were overturned by the 13th Amendment, and, uh, which overturned the slavery, uh, and also the 14th Amendment, which, allowed, which gave citizenship to freed slaves as such. So that, that, but again, even with all that, by the 1870s, there were still things that, you know, African-Americans had to still fight for to get the basic right to do in a state that was supposedly free, so. In fact, there's a question about that. I'll just say that somebody asked about getting a recording of this presentation. Certainly can do that. Uh, I left my email earlier in the discussion, sturner at sachistorymuseum.org. And that's also where you can send uh, suggestions for talking history of the future, topics, uh, speakers that you would like to uh, see and hear from. I would, I would sure appreciate hearing that. Well, uh, I would also so, like to, uh, yeah. let me see, can I, this yeah. is a book, this is a book that I would highly recommend to anyone who wants, to, can they, are they seeing it, able to see it? Okay, who's, see the, who's the author? That's, uh, it's in di di different offices and that it's basically uh, a compilation of articles uh, by, uh, it's uh, different authors from different disciplines in history. It's called Seeking El Dorado. And uh, it's the editors are Lawrence B. De Graff, and that's capital D-E, capital G, R A A F, Kevin Mulroy, and that's uh, Kevin K K E V I N Mulroy M U L R O Y, and Quintard Q U I N T A R D Taylor, who yeah. I consider to be the the the, the black uh, godfather of the study of African Americans and Western history in the Western United States. Okay, I yes. put that in the chat so you can yes. look. Um, but you yes. related to what you just said with the question, were the struggles of reconstruction and voting rights from the South in the late 19th century also echoed here in California? Uh, reconstruction, yes, between, I would say between the time the Civil War ended, obviously, and the time the uh, uh, 15th Amendment was passed, in uh, 1870, yes, those those struggles still occurred. Uh, one because uh, uh, the, the 15th Amendment just basically kind of knocked it out of the park for black men. <laughs> Obviously, not for black women. But uh, so yeah, there were still there were still efforts to get um, some, some some type of a, a franchise available to African Americans so they could at least vote in, in local elections and state elections. But uh, really. 
uh, that wasn't going to happen until the uh, 15th Amendment was passed. Another question. Can you talk about Daniel Blue's involvement in California's last slave case here in Sacramento? That's, that's something I haven't really studied that much of because I keep hearing different takes on it. <laughs> so, um, and in reality, I don't know if it's really the last slave case. I'm trying to, I can't, I haven't really read that much about it to, to have followed it. I understand that it involved a, a, a woman or girl that was staying with Daniel Blue. I don't know. I have to, I, I, at this time, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to really answer that. I do know that Jeremiah B. Sanderson, uh, when he was living in Stockton, before he moved to LA and, and uh, was, was killed in an accident, uh, was uh, involved with the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office at that time to root out uh, clandestine slave uh, areas that were still in effect after the Civil War ended. I think some of those lasted up until like, uh, some of those cases lasted up until the late 1860s, maybe early 1870s. So there were cases, there were instances where uh, slaves were still, you know, people were just like, just like Juneteenth, you know? <laughs> hey, slavery ended back in, uh, you know. So there was, there was still pockets of California where the word had got to. And I can imagine because California really wasn't that well settled. You can still go in certain parts of California and hide in terms of, you know, um, some of the more uh, rural counties in the state. But yeah, there were, there, there, I think uh, 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 the historian Baltich, uh, I forget the first name, who did the history of African-Americans in, in San Joaquin County talked about that, that Je uh, Jeremiah B. Sanderson was involved with working with the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office to try to find these different places where uh, African-Americans were still clandestinely working without being paid. Do, do you know what had become of the girl that you mentioned that had been, that was freed, who was freed? Uh, the girl that was mentioned in the first in the previous question with Daniel uh, Blue? Um, I, this came right before the question. Uh, maybe you can clarify your question uh, and because we'll, we'll go to the next question. And if you have a clarification, I can add to it. Uh, it, it the other question is, there a, is there a biography of James Beckworth? Yes, there's a, uh, let me, in fact, there's two. Well, James, James Beckworth did his own as told to biography. Excuse my getting up here. In my estimation, these are the two best. Um, one is called The Life and Adventures of James Beckworth. Are you seeing, can you, can, are you seeing it where you can read it? Yeah, and I'm going to type it in so uh, people can get a record of it. This is, this is the one that he basically uh, hired a gentleman to tell his story to. And the gentleman wrote down pretty much everything he said. <laughs> The interesting thing about uh, Beckworth is he's reputed as he's reputed to have noted every time he was the guy was you know writing what he was saying down he would always use the term paint her up paint her up <laughs> paint her up bugger put it paint her up which means embellish it <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. but that, whether that, whether that story is true or not I, you know that's that's a, but it's it's by uh, Thomas B uh, Thomas D Bonner and uh, that's as told to that's as basically told by James Beckworth himself. The other one is uh, by Eleanor Wilson, uh, Eleanor, E-L-I-N-O-R, Wilson. And it's called, and this is, this is a, an extremely long title. You, know, you could probably Google it and maybe write the title later or something, but. Okay, I will go uh, Trapper and then Ellipsis Quotes. And yeah, that should be enough for people okay. to Google. And Eleanor, you said is L E L I N O R? No, yes, e L Eleanor Wilson. And the oh. title of the book is James Beckworth, Black Mountain Man, War Chief of the Crows, Trader, Trapper, Explorer, Frontiersman, Guide, Scout, Interpreter, 
adventurer and gaudy liar. Now, paint her up, <laughs> paint her up, like you said. <laughs> but, but, but all, all, all the, all these guys, kick all these, all these mountain men that were uh, eventually interviewed for their role in the, the, you know, the winning of the West, so to speak, or the exploring of the West. They all embellished. It was, you know. Dime novels. That's why dime novels were invented because they embellished the story to the point where he, the guy has superhuman qualities. <laughs> but I, I will say this about Jim Beckworth, though: um, if a guy can survive all the stuff that he dealt with in terms of you know Seminole Wars and you know because uh, the Seminole War basically that was a tie. The United States didn't really win that war. We negotiated with the Seminoles and, and some of the other tribes we were fighting with with a treaty because <laughs> it was it was like fighting vietnam in the 19th century yeah. <laughs> it was like jungle warfare and they just hey we don't want to do this this is we're not equipped for this so basically for him in fact james beckworth said so much said about the same thing himself in his account was that he was lucky to get out alive <laughs> and also the other thing about the Seminole wars that a lot of people don't know is the Seminole wars were a struggle between the seminoles and their black slave allies against the United States Army because Seminoles were like an escape hatch that black slaves used to escape from South Carolina, mm-hmm. from Georgia into Florida. And so the Seminoles would take him in and it turned out that Chief Osceola, who was the chief of the Seminoles, married one of the escaped slaves, a black woman. And the slave traders tried to come and take her away that, and that uh, basically he went on the war path. And that's how the war kind of got started. Wow. <laughs> so. Very, very, inter- very interesting stuff. <laughs> so returning to that question about the girl who was free, yes, that was in reference to Daniel Blue. Do, yeah, do you know, and again, I have no... Came with that girl. Yeah, I have, I, one, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the case, and two, uh, I have no idea what might have happened to her. Uh, but depending on when she was, when she... Because if this, uh, did it happen after the Civil War? I am not, I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with it. Um, I, I, I imagine somebody who's retired as a story and is probably going to go chasing down there. Yeah, yeah, chase yeah, Please, <laughs> please do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to chase it down if I can, because it's not, it's not a story that's been. That... 1864. 1864. Is... 64. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so the Civil War is still going on. Okay. Yeah, I love to uh, find out more about that. And yep. I've never, I've never read any accounts from either the church histories because you know, Daniel Blue continued to be involved with the church or from other histories involving him that, that spoke to it. So we'll have to, I'll, I'll have to check it out. Sorry, I don't know everything. <laughs> That's the next. That's and the next. Don't, don't, don't even pretend to. <laughs> next, next time. Uh, another question. Do you know what role Blacks played in the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad? Uh, there's not much evidence of that in terms of I'm sure there probably were. Um, The Transcontinental Railroad, in terms of uh, going from Sacramento east to Promontory Point, was primarily a Chinese and uh, Irish American enterprise. Uh, There may have been African Americans involved with with it, but I've never uh, run across any names that would give me any hints as to who those people might have been. I think it's an interesting question, interesting topic. Um, that work was very dangerous. And uh, the reason the Chinese basically stuck with it as well as they did was because they were the ones willing to take all the risks. And they were the ones who paid the biggest price because you know, coming from west to east, from east to west was pretty flat. <laughs> they weren't going through the Sierras, you know, blowing out tunnels and doing all this other crazy madness that required them to get over the Sierras. So, uh, no, I, that's an interesting question. I'll have to check and see if there's any evidence. Now, I do know that African-Americans did take, uh, take, uh, did have jobs and worked at the Southern Pacific uh, Depot, or where the Southern Pacific Depot is now, the rail yards, when it was a manufacturing operation. But uh, beyond that, I have, don't have many ideas on to, as to whether they were involved. You know, I think I'll check, uh, I'll check the, uh, no, they wouldn't know either. This is 1869. Maybe I'll check the elevator to see if they, they have any idea. But again, it was primarily Chinese and Irish. And, sure. 
And circling mm -hmm. back once more to the uh, Daniel Blue question, uh, these questions are coming from people who um, I have strong suspicion work at the Center for Sacramento History. And so I think they are offering to help you out if you help want to- Help me out. Yes, please do. Please, please do. If you, got, if you have any any information about that at all, because again, I've only heard, I think I heard that question, the question about that. And I, you know, I kind of read around some of what was on the internet because, you know, finding documentation like that is extremely difficult right now if it hasn't been, you know, sorted out or gotten through in terms of newspaper articles and things of that nature. So uh, so I didn't know what to make of it when I first got wind of it, because again, I hadn't I didn't run across it in any of my initial studies and any later studies that I've done. So uh, please help me out if you can. Let me know what you, what you find. I think that's what they're <laughs> aiming to do. So I, I have a question. Were, were there Black people who were considered indigenous to this land? You know, I find that a very interesting question because um, a number of my friends of mine were Native American and a few from this particular area, tribal area. I suspect that the answer may be no, but I think if you do see a Native American a modern day Native, Native American whose ancestry goes back into the latter, you know, early years, uh, pre-gold rush. If you do see one with fairly kinky hair, it may be because maybe they intermarried with the Hawaiian, because Hawaiians were among the first, Hawaiians were here when, when Sutter was here, because <laughs> he hired him out, you know, hired him to work on his, on his fort. And uh, who knows if it, in fact, Liedersdorf, uh, like I said, he went to the Hawaiian Islands in one of his voyages, so it was a popular jumping off point. So it could very well be that uh, maybe Spanish explorers or maybe others, uh, English explorers who later made their way back to California uh, may have had Hawaiians with them. That would be my guess. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any, it's almost like you know, trying to answer the question about uh, the, the Olmecs in uh, Mexico. Yeah, that's a possibility. Now that's a possibility. Because any way you leave Africa going west, you're going to hit land. There's no way you can be going around the corn or up over the Arctic Circle. You're going to hit land somewhere. So all those tribes that may on the east coast of Mexico or on uh, the east coast of the United States that may have some sort of qualities that you think might have some African lineage in, behind it, it may real, very well be that uh, maybe some African group you know, the stereotype has always been Africans didn't sail, they didn't do this, blah, blah. That's, you know, no, that's, they did. <laughs> In fact, the most likely theory that I've heard about the Olmecs is that Mansa Musa, who, who had the, the kingdom of Ghana back in the 13th, 12th or 13th century, was so wealthy that he could commission boats to go to different parts of, uh, you know, the New World if he wanted to. So that, you know, I don't, I don't discount that out of hand whatsoever. If the Vikings do it, they can do it. If the Polynesians, if the Polynesians could do it. Look at where they've sailed from yeah. the last couple of thousand years across the Pacific. Then the Africans can do it. I don't discount anything. <laughs> where did the African American Californios come from? Uh, basically, from um, well, you know, Mexico. Long story short, Mexico started the African slave trade into the New World right after Pizarro conquered Mexico in 1521. They used Veracruz as a point of entry. And so Veracruz received all the African slaves that were imported through Spain, from, through the Spanish in, uh, into Mexico, a hundred years. They, they did that a hundred years before the first black man stepped foot in Jamestown in 1619. So you figure with a hundred year jump, <laughs> Africans were in Mexico, uh, they started off um, working whatever industries they had going on in, in uh, Eastern Mexico, probably, uh, who knows, maybe sugar, sugar cane or whatever. And then they dispersed and made their way uh, across Mexico into Western Mexico. And a lot of them ended up in Sinaloa. Mm. And so the first expeditions that came into California uh, in 1769 to found the first, you know, with Father Sarah to find, found the first 
missions and pueblos and, and, and presidios, uh, those people came up primarily for Sinaloa. And so uh, again, they were of a wide variety of uh, black and mestizo and mulatto. Like I said, the 1790 census points it out pretty graphically. And uh, they spread all the way up into Calif into uh, you know Sonoma. It's hence the uh, and you know a lot of these a lot of these uh, Californios uh, understood the racial hierarchy of, of Latin California at that time, so they have what they call certificates of blood <laughs> that they use to upgrade, so to speak, <laughs> their racial uh, lineage because there was a hierarchy. There's the Espanols on top. Uh, mestizos, and then the uh, native peoples, and then the blacks. Blacks and natives were always at the bottom of those of those hierarchies. So if you could elevate, if you could buy your way into the upper upper racial lines of the racial hierarchy, people did that. Which is why, to, which is why today, uh, you know, most most uh, people don't understand how how much the. In fact, in Mexico, they call it the third leg of the school, the third leg of the stool. You know, the Mexican. The Indian and the third leg is the African, and they're just now coming to grips with that because more evidence of that is is pretty apparent now. Hmm. Uh, what role did blacks play ferrying cargo on the Sacramento River? Were they captains, laborers, deckhands? Probably mostly laborers and deckhands. Um, it would would have cost a pretty significant money, amount of money to own a boat at that time and to uh, run the cargo. And I don't know if there were that many, with the small population numbers, I don't know how many African-Americans had uh, the ability or the time. You would probably need to live in San Francisco or something in order to be able to get into the sailing side of it. But by and large, uh, if you worked at uh, any ports or anything, which was an experience that a lot of slaves had uh, back in back south, they worked in the docks and ports of the Southern states and the Eastern Atlantic states uh, as dock workers and, and porters and things of that nature. So they would have been more familiar with that. It would have been more of an investment financially to become a ship's captain of some kind. And they probably didn't allow it anyway, who knows? Well, sir, you have uh, been very generous with your time and expertise tonight and making for an enriching evening. evening so. I appreciate it. And I uh, guess speaking on behalf of the all the guests in the museum, I thank you very much for sharing with us. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. I think um, I was trying not to put everybody to sleep. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, there's a, again, like I said, this is an overview. And I think this all deserves as much research as anybody can give to uh, finding out more about it. Uh, whether you do it on your own, or whether you do it as a student in a school or an institution, educational institution, I think it's an area worth uh, worth mining. Uh, just ask William Berg and others that have you know mined as deep, you know, continue on what I've done and to bring it to uh, fruition. Ask uh, Michael Harris, who's you know, uh, you know, given me props in terms of personal props in terms of you know uh, getting him going and exploring more about Liedersdorf and the, and the mining uh, camps up there. So uh, thank you very much. Thank oh, you again. You. Yeah, it was my it pleasure. Inspire many in the audience to seek out this information inspired by you. And uh, as long as we don't paint her up, we'll be OK. <laughs> no, there's, there'll be no painting up from here. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being part of this new uh, this uh, inaugural program. Couldn't ask for better than Clarence Caesar to start it off. And again, ideas and topics, uh, speakers, I'd love to hear about it. Just email me and this will be available uh, and I can, I can send this out to people who would like to uh, to see it again. So, and then okay. it be a lot. Is there a way I can get those comments? <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's uh, also part of, uh, that's also part of the record and we'd be happy to furnish sure, that. Sure, I love it. Thank you. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for, for listening and, and uh, thank you for your wonderful comments and looking forward to talking to you again. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Oh, I should say uh, thanks. Special thanks to Zoe, Allie, and Susan, producers of the show for making sure it went smoothly and I didn't endanger its production. So <laughs> 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 I better leave now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Susan and Ali, for your help. <laughs>